Today's reading is from John chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. It is on page 874 of your Pew Bible. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flock drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come back. The woman woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as those these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one else has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, uh, four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor, Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. 
Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to them, he asked, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. So last week I got to preach on John 3, a reading that ended with two ideas that live in tension with each other. I noted that two consecutive verses each represented a different stream of biblical theology. One stream claims that God will one day save some, most obviously those who believe in the love of God. The other stream proclaims that God will one day save all. Even the enemies of God's people Israel, to remind you of one example I mentioned from Isaiah. I talked about how the Spirit of God has fed these biblical streams intentionally. So that instead of me or you landing on an answer to an unanswerable question, instead of comfortably resting in some self-righteous confidence about who gets saved and how they get saved, instead of those smug feelings of, I don't have to wonder about God anymore. I know exactly how everything to do with God works. God knows that how we'll proceed if we don't live in the tension between possibilities, it's going to be a way that feels pretty self-righteous, pretty disengaged from God. And when we live in the tension, admitting we can't know the answers to all questions, that's when we remain engaged with God, wrestling with God, feeling with God, wondering with God. And that kind of engagement is where and how faith happens. A relationship with God happens. And so to end my sermon, I turned it around a little bit because as much as we think there are unanswerable questions regarding God and God's ways, aren't each of us, to some extent, our own bundle of mysteries? Saint in this moment, generously offering compassion to that person, while sinner in that moment, selfishly taking from those people in some other moment. And yet, I said, God doesn't smugly say to God's self, well, I don't have to wonder about Jason anymore. I know exactly how everything to do with Jason works and how it doesn't work. The good news I proclaimed last week was that God does keep wondering about each one of us about all of us together. By living in the tension we provide God as saint and sinner, God remains engaged with us through all of it. And today's text provides as good an example of what that looks like as any I can think of. I am the woman at the well, and so are you. We are together, the woman at the well. And so to get into this story, there's something about numbers here. The Beatles had a lot of number one hits, and one of them included a weird number. I ain't got nothing but love, babe, eight days a week. Eight days a week. I remember hearing that the first time and thinking, there's only, there are only seven days in a week, right? Of course, the Beatles were aware there are just seven days in a week. Eight days a week was a way to exaggerate how much I love you. Well, John, the gospel writer, he plays this game too. Numbers throughout Scripture get used to emphasize and exaggerate and make a point. So like in the book of Revelation, the beast wears the number 666 because just like everybody in the modern era knows there are seven days in a week, in the time when Revelation was written, everybody knew that six is one away from done. Because the number of done, the number of completion, again, everybody just knew this, was seven. So 666 would have come across as almost, almost, almost. 
John tells us the Christ is the one who will bring completion to all those sixes in Revelation. Six is the number of close but no cigar. So 666 is the perfect number for the beast, for sin, death, and the power of the devil, because they're not the end. Sevens are prime. Math puns, huh? Seven means arrival, completion, totality. And that's why, as John the Gospel writer writes, he famously includes Jesus identifying himself seven times. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. But before he says any of these seven I am statements, he utters his first I am. So you could say there are eight. It's like Jesus is Messiah eight days a week. And we just heard that first I am as Jesus engages in the longest conversation Jesus has with anyone in any of the Gospels. John tells us that Jesus was making his way from Judea back home to Galilee. He's going north. Well, between those two regions is Samaria. Unavoidable. Awkward maybe even a little hostile, Samaria. Jacob's well is near a city in Samaria, Sychar, where Jesus stops to rest. And that's when a Samaritan woman, no surprise, they're in Samaria, but she comes up to the well to draw water and, well, have you ever seen somebody in the store and pretended not to see them? Some of you have done that to me before. I've seen you. <laughs> maybe you walk the other way. Well, Jesus, seeing the Samaritan woman coming, Jesus doesn't go anywhere. He doesn't even just stay to himself and, like, stare at the ground while she gets her water. That's maybe what he's supposed to do. But instead, he talks to her, which actually is a thing. Men and women are just not supposed to interact, much less Jews and Samaritans. Just, you know, keep your nose down, Jesus, and follow the unwritten rule. But no, Jesus says, give me a drink. But you know, as much as Jesus breaks an unwritten code of silence here, so does the woman. She doesn't just meekly give him water to drink, avert her eyes from his gaze and go back to where she came from. She responds, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And we're off. Jesus and this woman at Jacob's well enter into a conversation that will make waves from this place and from this moment through Samaria, down through the centuries, all the way to us here today. In many ways, it's a confessional conversation where Jesus discloses who he is and what exactly is happening. For all the mystery that usually surrounds Jesus and many of the cryptic answers or responses that he offers that oftentimes sound like riddles, here Jesus just like bears his soul. It reminds me of moments in superhero movies when they might finally want to disclose the truth of their identity to someone they think maybe they can trust. You know, Batman wants to tell Vicki Vale. Superman wants to tell Lois Lane. Spider-Man wants to tell Aunt May. But can I trust her? Should I, should I burden this person with the truth? How do you trust someone with some things? Have you ever had something you wanted to share, but for whatever reason you had a hard time sharing it? I remember being really nervous about asking Carla to marry me and telling others before I did this, telling others I was planning on asking her was almost as hard. I mean, I was pretty confident she was going to say yes, but what if, what if I told you before I asked her whether you are my parents or my sister or a friend of mine, what if I told you and you were like, her? 
Or what if you said, you think she's going to say yes to you? Like, there's a lot of vulnerability in sharing some greatest hope or some dream that you have. When somebody asks a high school senior what their plans are for the fall, what a vulnerable question, actually. I've asked that question hundreds of times over the years, but now I hear my own daughter being asked this year as a senior, and I've noticed how vulnerable that question makes somebody. Like, to say, to admit what you think you're going to be or what you think you're capable of. Well, what if somebody hears your answer and is like, you? <laughs> Good luck. Because that's kind of what you put out there, right? Admitting what we like or, or who we love. Can you imagine coming out as gay or lesbian or transgender to family or friends whom you just, you can't know how they're going to react to you? I know some of you can imagine that scenario because you've done it. And to you I say, oh, wow, your courage amazes me. As I wrote this sermon, I found a site full of coming out stories, the courage it takes, especially to tell that first person, that first time. It blows my mind. That's the level of intimacy, of vulnerability, that Jesus enters into with this woman at the well. Jesus knows his identity as Messiah is going to lead to trouble with at least some, maybe many, maybe everybody. Huh? He's not under any delusion that everybody's just going to accept that the son of a carpenter from Nazareth is the Messiah they've all been waiting for. And yet he is who he is. So who does he tell? Who can he tell? Who will Jesus trust with this identity? With whom can he be so vulnerable and so bold? He's got these gifts to share. He's got a new way of life to lead. He is a gift to the world. Who will he entrust with this gift? So he sits at a well and strikes up a conversation with this Samaritan woman. If you knew who is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Those who drink the water I will give will never be thirsty. The water I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And the woman says, Sir, give me this water. And then, well, then comes a really strange-seeming turn in the conversation. Jesus says, Go call your husband and come back. That doesn't seem connected to this conversation. Jennifer Garcia Bashaw, her commentary helped me with this. She said, this scene, a man meeting a woman at a well at midday, this is a well-established scene type that famously happens at least a couple other times in the Old Testament. Abraham's servant, you might remember, found Rebekah at a well at midday. Jacob met Rachel. Maybe at this very well in Samaria at midday. So when John writes his gospel and goes out of his way to tell us, if you notice at the very beginning of the reading we heard Carol just read, John goes out of his way to tell us Jesus is at Jacob's well and it is about noon. Well, John the gospel writer is wanting us to kind of think we're in that kind of a moment, in that kind of intimate, vulnerable moment. So Jesus asks her, to call her husband. I have no husband, she says. And this is where Jesus can communicate to her. He is not merely some guy at this well spouting nonsense. He wants her to understand he knows her and spouts truth that leads to eternal life. He sees her. He knows she's had five husbands, likely because she's been widowed? Maybe men have divorced her multiple times for reasons she can't control. No matter why she's been married so many times, the point is Jesus knows this about her, and as readers, it only adds to how unlikely of all people this person, this unnamed, many times married, Samaritan woman would be the one whom Jesus would sit down with and have his longest, most vulnerable conversation that he has in any of the Gospels. 
the woman says, I see you are a prophet. And that leads her then to name the distance between them. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. There seem to be so many obstacles between these two humans. They don't know each other's name. Their pasts would not have led them into the same circles. They are opposite gender. They're from different parts of the world where God is worshipped very differently. And that's when Jesus gives her the good news. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For God is spirit, Jesus says. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus just lays his cards out there for her to see. The time is coming when what divides them will be mended. Together, all are going to worship the one God together in spirit and truth. Isn't that great? And this is when the woman at the well has the power to believe in him or laugh at him. Jesus has entrusted this good news to her, of all people. But what's she going to say? She meets the vulnerability of Jesus putting his truth out there and offers her own as she admits her hope. She says, I know the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he'll proclaim all things to us. And that's when Jesus takes the biggest risk of all in this conversation. That's when he entrusts his very identity as Messiah with another person on this earth, knowing that some, maybe many, maybe everybody is going to despise him. I know that the Messiah is coming, she says. And Jesus responds, I am the one who is speaking to you. I am the name God gave Moses when Moses asked, if Israel asks me what your name is, what shall I say to them? Say, I am has sent me to you. And now Jesus claims that identity for himself. The last thing John says in his gospel is, now Jesus did lots of other things which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. No other gospel just spells out their purpose quite so clearly. But just once does Jesus so clearly reveal this truth to someone in particular, that I am the Messiah. And of all people, the person he entrusts himself to is a five times married, unnamed Samaritan woman. Not only is the message the point of this text, that God is spirit, that God can be worshipped by anyone anywhere, but the point of this text is also who the message is given to. Jesus does not wait at that well for the most respectable person to come along or for the most powerful person to come along. Jesus simply engages with this woman, and she receives him and enters into conversation with him. He speaks truth. She receives that, too. He speaks words of hope. She admits her own hope. And in that exchange is faith. This episode for me is like reading a prayer scene. And the good news is Jesus is willing to enter into prayer with anyone, anywhere. The Samaritan woman, she's just out for water and received a spring of water that brought her to a new relationship with the living God. And she was able to receive the good news of Jesus because she was willing to engage with Jesus. She was willing to engage in conversation even though she was breaking an unwritten rule. How is your prayer life? 
It's not like she went to that well prepared for an encounter with God. How are, how are your preparations for some encounter with God? Are you ready to bring the courage of the Samaritan woman to your conversations with God? Because God brings God's kind of courage to you. Even though you have the power to deny God, you have the power to ignore God, you have the power to laugh at God's grace. Like, pfft. Are you receiving the good news that God knows you, all that you are? That God entrusts you with God's very own identity? That you matter to God as much as anyone? And do you allow all that good news to transform your fears and worries into hope? That's what God is offering this woman at the well. A relationship that will be transformational. And the good news is, I am the woman at the well. You are the woman at the well. And we together are the woman at the well. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing.